Kishen. I'm actually from the Netherlands and um, I moved with my family to Plymouth in England last year uh, to uh, follow an education program. I wanted to get a master's degree. I really had no interest in sustainability at all. So sorry for everyone. <laughs> The thing is, I had this talk with my lecturer and um, uh, which program I could follow. And um, because I am an e-twinning ambassador in the Netherlands uh, and I have a lot of interest in foreign language learning. And she said, well, the sustainability topics sound very interesting for you because it's global education, outdoor learning. And I had this idea of meeting a group of green woolen socks vegetarian people that i would not be able to relate to at all uh so uh but i started and i can tell you this has been um the most wonderful experience of my life i am now also a vegetarian <laughs> so um it uh what happened was um in, 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 in a very short space of time, because you are immersing yourself with all these topics, I went from no knowledge to boom, uh, all this knowledge. And um, uh, it, was, it was shocking, it was wonderful. But especially the, the people that are interested in sustainability education, it felt like coming home. And it is a bit how I felt with e-twinning always. You know, when you have that interest, yourself and uh, I, it's just be become my core topic now and so I'm going back to the Netherlands and I'm going to uh, continue with my work there as teaching English as a foreign language to primary school children but I'm going to do it completely different <laughs> and all of my assignments uh, that I've been working on I've been uh, connecting sustainability to foreign language acquisition. So how can I um, improve my education and how can I uh, use that in my work? So uh, I think this might be of interest uh, of you to you because of course, um, most of you have to also use a foreign language when you do e-twinning projects. So uh, hopefully this will, this will help you in your work. So, um, the modules that I followed uh, uh, this year uh, were alternatives in education. Um, this was, I was just going to go through it shortly because it leads up and it will explain to you the process that I've gone through. Um, so the alternatives in education module uh, was more about your utopia of education. And um, uh, our assignment was to think of your utopia. So what would be the ideal setting if everything was possible? And um, first you think, wow, this is great uh, because in education, there's always a lot not possible. And <laughs> so what if, if I have the ideal setting? But then I realized uh, it is actually quite difficult for a teacher to have everything they want because we are so used to working with problems, solving them. Uh, we're, I think we're, as teachers, we're masters in, in thinking, okay, how can we make this better? And um, so that process made me think, okay, if I think e-twinning is so great, let's, let's look at what is wrong with it. And I didn't want to look at what was wrong with it because I love it. But I went through that process and it was depressing because um, I forced myself to be very critical of e-twinning. And, um, but God, by going through that experience, um, I was justifying what I thought was important about e-twinning. And I discovered uh, that what I thought was important wasn't exactly why we are uh, getting all these subsidies to do e-twinning. Um, my, it's very important for me to have the sense of equality in education. Um, so working together, connecting with other children, that is, that is what we all want, right? So that's what we think is important. But then I realized something very simple, like, okay, so I do great projects with, uh, Poland. We have our iPads, we have our webcams, we have everything. And I'm thinking 
that I'm broadening the view of my students. But at the same time, we have a project for children in poverty and we're filling shoe boxes with toys and pencils and paper and sending that to those countries, as in we're helping those children. But am I not showing the children then that the children in Poland are different than the children that we're sending these shoe boxes to? Why can we work with iPads with these children? And is it okay for me to send pencils and, 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 and notebooks to the other children? So eTwinning, I discovered uh, that eTwinning has this eliteness about it. It is focused on, on making us grow, making our knowledge and economy grow. But it's not on equality because the rest of the world is not not doing this. So you see, it is it is a uh, yeah. Of course, I've been going through this all, and you might think, oh my God, she's, she's what is she talking about? But it's it's just challenging. The process that I went through is challenging myself to think about what are my reasons for taking part, and my most of my core reasons are equality, and. I'm working in something that isn't really about that at all. It's the outset is, is to improve our knowledge economy, to enhance jobs in the job market. And then that's economic growth. And that is not sustainability. So you see where, I, do you understand where I'm coming from with this? I, I can't follow the chat, but <laughs> I, I think I better not be there. <laughs> you follow. Okay. We don't follow you. You're... Okay, so that was one uh, yeah. thing uh, you, during my modules that I that but this woke me up to thinking critically about what I was actually doing myself. And uh, uh, I was still convinced at the end of the assignment that I was, wanted to proceed with each winning, because one of the most important things that I learned from that lecture was that we have to believe in small pockets of change. So we cannot change the world. But I do believe by what we are doing with eTwinning and sustainability and, and the projects that we're doing, we are, we are changing with small pockets. And how we do that and how we get there is not so important. We're taking the action. So that is what I got from that. So the next one was uh, the experience of outdoor learning. And um, what I discovered was um, that most of the children spend eight hours a day using screens because uh, a lot of children now even use screens in school they're inside their outside time is is mostly 30 minutes a day and um the 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 whole point of it is that you can't teach children to love the world if they're not in the world you can't let them love the world from a screen so um, if you uh, follow Sobel, um, if I just click to, I think I've got him here. Uh, no, I right here. No, oh, here he is. Yes. So the idea is that children uh, cannot learn about the environment from, from screens, but they need to get wet and dirty in order to fall in love with the earth. And um, this is one of, uh, Sobel is one of the, the, the main, main um, writers that I've come across a lot in my research. And I will give you some more information on key thinkers that I think um, if you've not come across them yet, it's worthwhile reading about it. And Sobel is very much on uh, place-based education. So learning from your own environment and how important that is. So, um, I'll get back to that in a minute. Okay, so my experience for outdoor learning was that, and uh, so I had global education and ecological and sustainable literacy. And if I go to the next slide, you can actually see my uh, assignment titles that I used for these uh, different modules. And um, one very interesting thing for me was the moral matters in foreign language development. So um, when we work in each winning projects and we work about sustainability, we want the children to engage and discuss on all these topics. But if you realize that if you uh, 
discuss a topic in a different language, it isn't. It doesn't really come to your heart as much as when you do it in your own language. You must realize this also. Even now, if, if English is not your first language, you're listening to me and you're hearing everything. But if I would be doing the same presentation in your own language, you would probably feel it more. And this is something that we need to uh, be aware of when we're doing sustainability topics, because it's the whole point of it is that we want the children to become aware and, and feel uh, connected to their environment. So if you're doing this in a second language, there's a good chance that their decision making is uh, morally affected. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do it in a second language. I'm just saying that it's something as a teacher you should be very aware of. So I thought about this, of course, because I teach English from the age of four to 12 in primary education. And I thought this actually justified the need for second language learning in primary education. Because if you have real life experiences from a young age with the environment in nature, and you also experience those things in a foreign language, then the whole moral development is uh, synchronized. So, um, if you want children later on in life to make moral judgments in a second language, much better to have that language uh, used, that they use the language that they've made the experiences in. And if English is going to be the language they're most likely to do that, then I, that would then, of course, justify the case. So that's uh, it just something I wanted to mention and I wanted and if there's there's a whole lot of literature on it that I can point you towards if you want to go into that but I just wanted to touch on it a little bit um so the basic thing about the connecting children across borders is what I've just mentioned with Sobel's idea of place-based education is um that children need to feel connected to their own place and uh, he did a, 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 a research on how children drew themselves in a map. So uh, children from the age of four to seven, they actually draw themselves in their house, in where they are, that's their environment. And then up to the age of eight, they probably draw a playground and their school. It's where they walk to, that's their environment. And from the age of 12, you will see a, a larger map. And if you use those simple examples in how you uh, uh, use the subjects that you teach the children, it uh, makes you understand in what is age appropriate for these children. And I touch a little bit more on that when I go to my next slide, so and then I can give you more examples. But this is basically what I've just been talking about. Um, okay. Okay, so now I get to the ethical considerations, and I just need to get my stories straight so I know that I'm not forgetting anything. Uh, sorry. Okay, so this is talking about the stages that you go through when you become to grips with climate change, and I, this is very much what I went through. Fast forward from not really dealing with anything sustainable. Of course, I separated my garbage and I thought I was being, you know, very environmentally conscious. And this is the whole thing. People think they are, but they're not. So there's a big, big message for education for how we can improve that. Um, so this is called eco awakening. So, you know, when you come across um, images on Facebook or, or adverts on television about poverty or uh, famine or, or, or even plastic soup in our oceans, you just have that phase where you don't want to know. I, I, I don't want to hear anything about this. It's too much. That's when you ignore it. And the second one is, okay, I'm aware that it's that it's there, but there's nothing I can do about it. 
And the third one is okay. I know there's something not quite right, but um, yeah. What do we do? What do we do? I can't go back. I know it's there, but something's not right. And then you get to the point of awakening. And when you realize, uh, okay, I am part of this earth. I, I want to change. I want to uh, uh, live more sustainable in this earth. And, and this is my new route in how I want to proceed. And I think I was here in um, at three months into my course. And then I noticed that I was living in a family who did not all of a sudden want to become vegetarians who did not appreciate my chucking out all the plastic bottles bottles and and rearranging and bringing in bamboo toothbrushes and all this everybody's like whoa what's going on <laughs> so then you uh uh also have that feeling okay um i'm realizing all the things that are wrong in the world uh but I don't think that anything is going to improve with whatever I'm doing. I don't think I have enough influence. I think it'll all go wrong. And this is a depression that happens. Okay. You could also feel very empowered. So, um, okay, I'm an educator. I'm a teacher. I'm an e-twinning. This is all the wonderful things that I can start doing. This is also great. And um, now and then you get it to the point of no return and then you know that when I go back to the Netherlands, there's no option for me to go back to the way I was teaching before I, I am going to have to change. And I can't see what's under six at the moment. Uh, there we go. OK, so then you move into action. OK, I put this here because as educators, we tend to sometimes throw the problems of the world into our classroom show the plastic pollution show the melting icebergs and the and, and and the polar bears drowning and um i think as educators it's very important to be aware of the eco awakening stages that also children go through and uh at the moment um a lot of children are suffering with eco anxiety this is not a a new trend this is something that is really happening and it's happening because children get the sense that they don't feel they have any power they don't know what they can do about it and i think it is wrong it is morally wrong of educators to put the problems of the world on our children's shoulders i yes we need to do something but i think we need to really critically think about how our approaches and how we do that so um I just have a small example that I wanted to share with you, and I want you to look very closely at uh, at the faces of the children. Okay, so, um, oh, I'm, I can't get, yeah, so here we go. Um, the faces of these children, they break my heart. And um, it is the same I saw with my own children when they were watching Blue Planet. They were enjoying the beautiful pictures of, of Blue Planet. But when they saw the melting icebergs and the, and, and, the, and, and, the, and the animals that could not be rescued, they got so upset. And you're showing the children images of they have no direct influence. So they will feel distraught. And of course, this is followed up with actions. 
which is fantastic. But those actions do not help that uh, polar bear that is drowning. So do you understand what I mean? It's, it's, it's the, so you're showing children images of they have no direct action on. And that can cause a very serious eco-anxiety situation. And when children get that depression, that eco-anxiety, it will, it will not empower them to help. It will just make them turn away from it. And we've been talking about these problems uh, of our environments for years. And still there are people not taking action. So you have to wonder whether this approach is the correct approach or whether we should be focusing on a different approach. And this is where I um, have started to look at in my research. So here you can see uh, a television guide for which films children are allowed to see. And I think we should use the same type of guides in our teaching. We should think about what exactly are we putting our children through when we are talking about sustainability. And uh, here's a funny picture I found about eco anxiety and how we can change eco anxiety into hope. And I do have a, I, I do have another approach that I <laughs> so I'm not awful awful awful. I just wanted to to raise the problem. So um, so I think we have a responsibility as educators to really think about this. And I don't know if uh, all of the people here are teaching children from 16 and up, and it's a completely completely different ball game. But if there are also uh, teachers here that that are looking about teaching primary school children i think it's very important to be aware of but also for yourself to to realize what the stages are that we go through when we think about the environment okay so um so we need perspective we need hope i think the only reason the way that we can uh, move forward is that we give children a hopeful future and not to, I'm not saying you can't tell them the truth. I'm just thinking, I'm saying you have to be aware of their stages of development. And you always have to, uh, as an educator, give them hope and perspective. And one of the ways to do that, of course, is with action and the projects that we work on. Um, uh, but action that is related to their own environment, and that's where I get to place-based education. So I've, um, oh, what's happened? I've worked on a on an e-twinning project where I'm using all of this information and uh, built it in with with lots of um, uh, activities for children that have nothing to do with pollution or with uh, the 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 major problems of the world that I was just talking about, but has everything to do with their own local environment. And I, um, uh, all the activities that I prepared are for children to uh, start loving the place that they live in. And one way of doing that is by sharing it with people in other countries. So a simple activity is even draw your playground from your school and then share it with someone else. But Another one is um, build a den in a forest and then share that den with someone in another country. And which materials did they use? And it's working and playing in their own environment that will really enhance their love for the place where they live. And it's, and it's from re re recent research that's been proven that children have, have had these experiences uh, well that, while they were young, these really important outdoor experience in nature those are the children that become active as adults not the children that have been shown how bad the state of the world is uh, and I, i've i've experienced here where i live at the moment i live at the seaside which is fantastic but there's children living only 200 meters away from the coast and they've never been to the sea there, so I think education has a very important role to take these children outside again and get them into nature. And I think that is with your each winning projects you can focus on by sharing those experiences outdoor and how you can uh, share the love of their place.
Okay, so um, and this is some of the examples that we propose in our projects. So, um, and the plan is that we're going to do an Erasmus application and we'll hear in August if that's uh, going to be uh, followed up, but then hopefully we'll be camping in each other's countries and building fires and sharing the love of our place together. And uh, I'm really excited about it because I really believe this is the way to uh, to um, yeah it, inspire and uh, get significant significant life experiences for the children to uh, move on from. So this leads me to my research question. Shall I pause a bit or sh shall I just go sh go on? Is it okay, Augustin? Shall I just continue? Yes. Just a question. Maria would like to know <clears throat> if if we avoid uh, the 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 children exposed to to this uh, tragical scenery or state or natural scenery. We, we if we are not overprotecting them um yes i think it is very important to be aware of the different age groups that you're teaching uh but it's the same issue with when you talk about terrorism or when you talk about um uh, wars you know when children ask questions i answer um children watch the news they see things around and um it is not wrong to answer their questions it is not it's just uh, a wrong approach to think by showing all these things that, that is going to change their actions later on in life it is a, it has the adverse effect so there should be definitely a very big balance and the balance should be more towards um valuable experiences in nature for the children to love the earth and that is the only way i think <laughs> but um so so uh, is, it, can i continue or is there can have i answered that question or okay right yes, please. okay yes, yes, so please. uh okay um, so the thing is, uh, with my research question, I want to, um, because I think we as educators, we have such an important role. Everybody in the sense group, if you compare how many teachers are in the sense group to the rest of each winning, it's a very small group. Um, but I think you, all of you who are listening, um, you have something very important, I believe, uh, that I want to find out about. Because what makes you want to, as a teacher, act uh, uh, in your practice with sustainability subjects? And what motivates you? And what, what is your reason for then following that up uh, in each winning projects? Because I believe that what you're doing is basically fantastic. And I believe it's a very powerful way of moving forward for sustainability. And uh, so what I just find very interesting is finding out who you are. And uh, the way I'm approaching it is through me my methodology is through uh, a qualitative approach. And I want to do a narrative inquiry. And uh, the reason I want to do narrative is uh, because I think it gives a, a, a wider picture of uh, the differences and of teachers and their stories in different countries. And it's something I can't just do in a, in a, in a survey. Uh, so what I'm going to request is, uh, well, this is basically the literary search, and I've already um, talked to you about some of the you know, place-based education and oops, and uh, sustainability literacy. Oh yeah, and the significance of the teacher's own experiences. So, so that is basically what I'm going to focus on, and my data will be uh, requesting an ecobiography. So. Um, an ecobiography is is a, is a form of life writing. So, 
um, this was one of the assignments I had to do during my course and it was uh, actually so vital to start with approaching sustainability. Because I always considered that I didn't really live in a very beautiful part of the world. I just lived in a village in the Netherlands and it's quite flat and it's not very interesting at all. So <laughs> that's what I thought. So um, uh, um, my family was from Britain and we regularly went on holiday to Britain and um, I loved the hills and the mountains and the forests and it was just a magical place to me. And my village wasn't that interesting at all, I thought. But then I started writing down about my experiences in nature as a child. And one of the most significant themes that popped up while I was writing this is my incredible sense of freedom that I had as a child. And um, I think that sense of freedom is so important to me now, even when I'm teaching. And I think it also has to do with the reason why I want to connect to other people in other countries. I want to spread my wings. I want to be free. And um, what, now my children go to, to school in England. And uh, even though things have changed a bit in the Netherlands, uh, the culture shock for me mostly was that children don't go to school on their own here. They don't go to the playground on their own here. They, don't, they are not free. So if there's, it's not a surprise that a child that lives 200 meters away from the sea has never seen it. it. Children go to school, they go back. And I'm not saying it's the same everywhere across the country. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just show, sharing this as an example of my experience. Um, uh, so my sense of freedom here is very restricted. It's one of the reasons I do not want to stay here. I want to go back to the Netherlands because I want my children to cycle to school in, the, in my lovely flat country. <laughs> but, um, but you know, so, and I think for everyone, and so for what I experienced in my lectures, everyone had to write their eco-biography. And it was so interesting because there's participants from different countries and uh, everyone shared such significantly different things when they recalled their memories of nature. But yet, even though they were all very different, we're all in this group and we all want to work on sustainability. So and I think those stories are so evident in how we want to change education. If you look at what is really at the core of who you are and how your experience in nature have been as a child, it will uh, make you think more clearly on how you want to proceed with your education and your teaching. So um, regardless of my own research, I want to invite you to start thinking about your experiences in nature as a child. And maybe on a sunny afternoon when you sit outside or wherever and have a cup of tea and whatever, start writing down your experiences. And it doesn't have to be a lot and you can take your time to do it even. But I guarantee you it will be a very worthwhile experience and um, and, and I hope it will benefit you in your teaching. And if you're very brave, you don't have to be brave, but if you feel that you would like to uh, contribute to my research, which, which, which I'm still looking for participants, um, uh, I would love for you to share your eco-biography uh, with me. I will use your uh, stories completely anonymous, so, so you won't have to worry about uh, anyone being able to identify you, but it would help me greatly, especially because you are in this sense group, you're my target group. So uh, um, uh, you are the educators that want to work on sustainability and do international collaboration. So I'd be very happy to receive some of your eco biographies if you have the time. I know we're all very busy, but um, anyway, so, so that is basically what I've, I think, I've come to conclude. Oh, yes. We yeah. can, sorry, we, we can write your email at the journal in our uh, sense group. Yes. Just for the participants. Uh, yeah, participate that would be, that would be in your wonderful. research. 
Uh, there is a, a little bit of a of a of a time limit for me. I have to, of course, start with my data collection and then my analy because I need to finish. I eventually have to go back to the Netherlands. You see, <laughs> so uh, if you do have time within the next one or two weeks to do it, then you, then you can still take part. That would be wonderful. And I just wanted to share this this from from Matra, which is another key thinker for sustainability education, and. Uh, I just need to move this and you can see, hang on, uh, is it going up? This book that I've recently purchased, it's new, it's 2018, it's, I've got it here. This has literally become my Bible dur during my, uh, my research. Uh, so it's on Amazon and you can also um, do the e-reader so you don't have to buy it in print. So maybe you can also put this up on on uh, on the twin page uh, because it's it's just very very compact and very uh, all the key thinkers are in, are in here and it's just a uh, different approach on education and it's more about uh, how we are a part of this world instead of looking at the world. So it's it's just it's I, I really and you know when environmental education is more about talking about projects and about the problems of the world and earth education is more how everything we do in education is about earth education so it's 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 a lovely it's a lovely book to look at and um yeah okay so okay so here is um uh, what I was one your willingness key in understanding on which approach education needs so I would really love to see your eco biographies and I also wanted to share with you this link and I'll, I'll make sure that uh, it will be it will be available to you on the on the twin page I'll just go here quickly this is my URLs page and I have a special section for place-based education it's, I've called it place-based education because I love it so much and um, this is all the articles, all the websites, all the stuff that I've used for my research and my assignments all together. So if you think any of these topics are of interest to you, you don't have to go Googling and searching. It's just accessible for you to just uh, find all the information I used. And that's much more out there. It's just a compact uh, uh, thing that I can offer you to look at. And... Um, Think. Yes, it's the end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claire. The, um, Anika is asking if you can share the link, but the, of course, here it, the, it is, and and we are recording the presentation, the webinar. So uh, we'll put this presentation. And the last ones, were, they took place in, in the days before, in our, in our group. Um, and this is another kind of uh, music that young, young people like. Um, I was talking to, I, I would like to show you before. And here, in our group, uh, sense group, uh, there are some um, sections, and in the learning corner, there will be all the the recordings or the videos, okay? like these ones, for example. So, I I invite you all to visit the group where you you'll find many interesting information um, and useful materials for you and your projects. And Claire, I don't know if you you have finished. Would you like to to say anything else about the, um, the webinar, yeah, well, this it, experience? It's, um, <laughs> it's quite hard. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm a, just a teacher. I'm just a primary school teacher, and I've I've gone through this amazing process, and I love it so much. And and then you want to share so much information at the same time. You're really realizing it's a research 
a corner that I'm coming from, so I should be probably be shower, showering you with lots of uh, technical information or, or other research. But, uh, you know, it's so much a matter of the heart. And when you start talking about subjects that you feel so strongly about, then it's, it's, it's hard to recall all the assignments uh, talk that I've been typing down and all the academic uh, things. It's just, well... Um, but I hope it was any, uh, useful to you. Well, thank you very much, Claire. And of course, thank you very much to Elena Pires and uh, Maria uh, for participating in this thank you for webinar. The opportunity. Um, because uh, because you, you have done a very fantastic work. And, and your communications are, oh, have, you. are been wonderful. And I don't know if there is any, any question of the participants. One of them would like to know, ah, that's the book. <laughs> uh, all the, the section is um, Learning Corner. Is the channel is a deep into. And if you have any other topic would like to that we in our group uh, is working, just please e email me. And we'll, I'll try the, my best to, to find some interesting um, people like Claire, Elena, and Maria. Thank you very much again. Um, I'm, I'm sure oh, we'll keep it Thank back you very in the much future. for all your time. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.